Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are so proud to be doing a series on modern Indian identity and to have such a distinguished series of speakers, and tonight certainly continues that. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. We do have a number of students here tonight. Yay! Young people, yay! Yay, students, yay! Uh, and wonderfully, interestingly, the Saturday American West has a certificate program. So you major in whatever you're majoring in, and then you have the joy of unending access to our candy box, our chocolate candy box, which also sometimes has paydays as well as chocolate-based substances. So, so am I pitching too low, do you think, here on that one? But uh, please, students, if you're interested, we have certificates. Uh, pamphlets here that tell you what it means. You major in whatever you're majoring in, then you do a, a program across the disciplines on the American West, and we would so love to have you do that. Okay, cell phone drill. Okay. Uh oh, there's mine over there. Uh oh. So, oh dear. Well, I will be working on that very soon when I'm back there. And then on uh, November, November 7th, we have an unusual Senate of the American West event. Uh, we are having our usual Words to Stir the Soul event where people read for five minutes from their favorite writing about the West, but we have reconfigured that so it is notable public officials, public servants, reading from their favorite writing about the West. We'll have uh, First Lady Jeannie Ritter, who's a wonder, who's a really great, great soul. We'll have two members of the Colorado Supreme Court, Chief Justice Mary Malarkey and Justice Greg Hobbs. We'll have uh, Mayor Hickenlooper from Denver will be our MC and so on and so on. There's a bunch of very fine people involved, so join us on November 7th. 7 o'clock, Old Main. 7 o'clock in November 7th. The number 7 will be key to that, that event. Okay, is that all I was supposed to announce? Old Main. At Old Main, which has nothing to do with 7, so it's hard to connect that. So, okay, okay, so. Uh, pardon? Seven. <laughs> All righty. Well, moving on now to where, what you came for rather than hearing me talk about the number seven. I don't think you came to hear that. I'm pretty sure you didn't come for that. So, no other announcements. All righty. Well, uh, what a privilege. We have tonight the author of this book, which I proudly hold in my hand and uh, which I have very much enjoyed and profited from reading. This is a book called Real Indians, Identity and the Survival of Native America. It's a book I'm, I am, for all kinds of reasons, happy to own and to read because so much of it is about taking a dilemma and finding some positive problem-solving responses to that. I'm not sure that until I read this book that I had a sense of how difficult the question of who is Indian and who is not Indian. I knew that was difficult, but I hadn't realized how much um, how productive that was of tension within tribes. And this book offers a very fine, very very sensible and good-hearted solution to some of those conflicts. Now, it is called Identity and the Survival of Native Americans. Americans called Real Indians. That might cause some people in the room to think that we will have a forum later on about the ethnic identity of certain University of Colorado professors. <laughs> no. As it turns out, no, that will not be the subject of tonight's <laughs> address. But if, if people came with that in mind, in the spirit of the Center of the American West, I will be off at the side at the reception over on an edge there. And anyone who wants to take part in a seminar on the ethnicity of University of Colorado professors, I will be conducting that seminar and I will listen responsibly and receptively to any thoughts you have on it. But our speaker is going to have a pleasant visit to Boulder. <laughs> so part of that will be uh, that I will absorb any feelings that people have about our own local issues. Dr. Garut, Eva Garut, received a PhD in sociology from Princeton. She's an associate professor of sociology at Boston College. She's an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation, the author of the book I've been waving around, around here, and which I really commend to your attention. It is written by an academic, and normal people can read it. Yay! Yay! Not an everyday experience in the academic world. She's working now, I'm, I'm proud to say she has an affiliation with the University of Colorado in Denver, the Health Sciences Center, and works on health issues and communications between Indian people and doctors on reservations, and that's uh, extremely important and consequential work. She's, well, working on a, a number of fine projects, including reminiscences and memoirs and autobiographies and personal statements by, by Indian people. And we are just lucky beyond words to have Dr. Eva Garut here to speak in our Modern Indian Identity series. Dr. Garut. Well, thank you.
thank you so much for having me here. Um, Y'all sure know how to show a teacher a good time. (laughs) I got here uh, Wednesday and have just uh, had an opportunity to teach uh, one of the classes here and was tremendously impressed with the quality of the students that you compare very favorably with anybody I've ever taught anywhere else. So I'm just, I'm proud to be here and thank you so much. And it's a beautiful city. I love it already. So I'm going to start out by telling you just a little bit about my tribe, which is the Cherokee Nation. With more than a quarter of a million citizens, the Cherokee Nation is one of the largest American Indian tribes in the United States. At one time, our traditional territory comprised the entire southeastern portion of the country. With the forced removal, however, in 1838 to 1839, the Cherokee people were displaced to Indian territory in what would later become called the state of Oklahoma. The Cherokee Nation today is not a reservation, but it's a jurisdictional service area encompassing 14 counties in northeastern Oklahoma within which the tribe exercises legal and governmental functions. And I can stand before you today as a formal legal citizen of that tribe. On the one hand, then, my Indianness is beyond dispute in the sense that both my tribe and the federal government have made the decision about my racial categorization on my behalf. And, you know, who really wants to argue with them? (laughs) And the legal status of citizenship is a very powerful one. It ensures that I can vote in tribal elections. I can run for political office. I can use tribal programs and generally participate fully in the life of the tribe. It's important. But to me, a legal definition feels kind of cold. Um, I wrote that book that Dr. Limerick just showed you, entitled Real Indians, in which I discussed all the different ways the Indian people talk about who's Indian enough to be Indian, and all of the overlapping and complex and often competing definitions for who should be understood as an Indian person, of which legal definitions are one. But shoot, I got a whole book out of it. There's more than one. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of them. And so I want to talk to you today about the humanity of things, the down and dirty lived experience of being a Cherokee in unexpected places and strange times. I want to talk to you of being a Cherokee of undeniably mixed ancestry and let's just say it, very little melanin. (laughs) I want to tell you the stories of the things that have shaped my identity as a Cherokee woman and of how I came to know myself as a Cherokee woman in a way that goes beyond just the bureaucratic machinery of law as important as that is. So let me just begin. When I was growing up in the 1960s, my school friends talked about watching TV shows. You remember them, right, some of you? The Brady Bunch, the Beverly Hillbillies, Lassie, Gilligan's Island, ah gee, you know, Gilligan's Island. After years of night courses, my father had taken a cut in pay from his factory job to become a grade school teacher in one of the poorest counties in New York State. And he said our family couldn't afford a television set. We didn't care. In the evenings, my two brothers and I would pile into bed with my parents, turn out all the lights, and listen to Dad telling us about growing up in the Cherokee Nation in the years of the Great Depression. And in the dark, 
I'm sorry, we won't be having questions during the talk. I'm sorry, we'll have questions no, after this. I just wanted to know where in New York State. Oh, <laughs> um, up near Cornell University. Oh, okay. We'll be having very short into the point questions again. <laughs> so, in the dark, we could see all the way to the Cookson Hills, that isolated patch of northeastern Oklahoma where little Cherokee communities still shelter in hollows and straggle game layup rocky swells in the Ozark foothills. We saw the little log house on 14 Mile Creek with its single room, the walls chinked with earth, and the fieldstone fireplace plastered with mud. This was where my father, his parents, and two sisters did all their living and sleeping. We eagerly stepped in our imagination into the lean-to behind the house where my grandmother cooked. We smelled the cornbread the biscuits with flour gravy, the shelled corn parched in a pan. We tasted the hominy, the young poke stalks, the eggs scrambled with wild onions, the pork fried in oil in a big black kettle at hog killing time, and the sorghum made from cane grown, pressed, and evaporated in the open air. We knew that if we were lucky, there might be a little sop meaning a biscuit covered with brown sugar and soaked with cold coffee. We stood with my father, uh, ankle deep in dust, on dirt roads baked so hot under the Oklahoma summer sun that they burned the tender skin between our toes. We raced heedlessly across the parched earth of the dust bowl, leaping crevices that cleaved the rain-starved soil into fissures deeper than we were tall curled around each other in the bed. My brothers and I sharpened our ears to hear the mournful songs of bullfrogs in the sloughs along the creek, the call of the whippoorwills in the evenings, and the spine-tingling screams of screech owls in the night. We waited eagerly for cold weather to turn the boneset plants into ice weeds glittering with delicate folds of frozen sap that looked like ribbon candy waiting to be snapped off and savored for their delicate sweetness. We walked to the one-room schoolhouse with our father and felt the bite of new snow on our bare feet because winter had come early and there wasn't yet any money for shoes. My brothers and I shifted in the bed and sighed in anxious sympathy at this last story. Oh, it wasn't bad. Dad reassured us. We were just kids. We thought it was fun at the time, and anyway, you just did what had to be done. My father's name is Onyal Garut. His father named him, but his mother never approved of the unwieldy label. She and everyone else, as it turned out, always called him Tommy. So there. <laughs> Dad's paternal grandparents had both applied to become original enrollees on the Dawes Roll, a census record created following an 1887 act of Congress that listed all Cherokee tribal citizens preliminary to the allotment of land in what was then Indian Territory. Allotment, which transferred Cherokee land from tribal control to individual ownership, was part of the federal government's efforts to disperse American Indian cultures and integrate Indian people into the dominant American way of life. According to Teddy Roosevelt, never a man to put too fine a point on things, allotment was to be, quote, a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. It aspired to make Indians over into duskier counterparts of the white homesteaders who struggled on their individual properties to wrest survival from the rocky red soil. What allotment did most effectively was to separate Cherokee people from their land. In less than a generation, fully 90% of Cherokee Nation lands in Indian Territory had passed out of Cherokee hands, and my father's family was no exception to that unmerciful rule. By the time Dad was born, received into the arms of a Cherokee midwife one October day in 1930, the family's allotment was long gone. He would sweat beside his parents tending corn, cotton, and tobacco 
on acreage belonging to others. They called the arrangement grain rent because the right to work the land was paid for with part of the yield. To say the same thing, my father's family were sharecroppers who had the bank for a partner. There were huge tracts of vacant land all over northeastern Oklahoma during the Great Depression, and much of it could have been bought for a few dollars in back taxes, but no one had any dollars. So dad and his sisters only ranged over those acres, collecting blackberries and huckleberries for his mother to put up in mason jars. There was small game in those fields and woods too, and dad joined neighbor boys in building box traps out of hollow logs to snare skunks for the few pennies their pelts would bring. They stalked possums in the persimmon groves and chased after rabbits. Should the small bows and arrows they fashioned by hand fail to produce results, they took to the creeks, wielding the forked spear that Cherokees have used as far back as anyone can remember. They gigged for frogs and crawdads, and they noodled fish by jamming their hands under rock shells to snatch out the black perch, chub, buffalo fish, sunnies, and catfish that lurked in the shadows. When noodling, Dad said, you just had to hang on to the optimistic theory that there wasn't an irritable water moccasin back in there, too. He couldn't really recommend the method. <laughs> the day's quarry or catch might be roasted over an open fire, not always with complete success, or it would find its way home to the family dinner table. His mother prepared wonderful frog legs, my father told us even if they did continue to kick long after entering the frying pan. <laughs> Cherokees are not known for harshly correcting their children, and my grandfather was no different. Whereas Dad's mother might have been inclined to assist her son's moral development by administering a little peach tree tea to the benefit of his backside, my grandfather would hear nothing of it. I knew that if I raised a hand to Tommy, Grandma always said, I'd have had to beat his father too. <laughs> to my grandfather, discipline meant a good talking to, and sometimes you would have rather had the whipping and got it over with, so Dad said. Other times misbehavior earned a story that taught you how to behave better and why you ought to. Some of those stories let you know about the skillies, scary spirit beings that came to carry away little Cherokee children who didn't do right. To hear Dad tell it, he wasn't a boy that needed much correction. But he must have pushed the line at least occasionally because he swore he saw a pair of skillies under the front porch once and caught a glimpse of one around a corner of the smokehouse on another occasion. The little cabin that housed Dad's family while modest, was not markedly inferior to the homes around them, and it was even superior to some. Dad told of visiting neighbors who had fashioned a dwelling out of two log cribs connected by a roofed open passageway or dog trot. This makeshift home sheltered five children and their parents. Another neighbor's cabin had only a dirt floor, a feature my father envied because even in rainy weather, the little boys in the household were able to play at making roads with their wooden trucks. Dad's young life, we learned, had been as rich in stories as he would later make ours. He liked to go visiting in the evenings because the older folks might get to build up a fire and get to tell him things. Those stories might be about spirit beings and supernatural things, and those made it hard to walk the path back to the house through the breathing, rustling woods. Dad wasn't quite sure he'd ever forgiven his older sister, Ruth, she of the longer legs, for dropping his hand and bolting away on one particularly inking, inky night, leaving him to find his own way home. The stories could also be about animals, sometimes ones you hoped you didn't meet, like the hoop snake, 
the hoop snake was even more dangerous than the copperheads that slithered through the yards or the water moccasins that lay thick all summer long along the, uh, over the rocks along the creek bank and on piles of driftwood. The hoop snake could make itself into a circle and roll after people, so the story went. The faster you ran, the faster it would roll, so there was no getting away. <laughs> Other stories took up current events and local figures. One of the more colorful denizens of the Cooks and Hills had to boast was Charles Arthur Pretty Boy Floyd. He was known as Purdy Boy in the local dialect, or simply as Chalk, after the local moonshine of the same name. Everyone knew that Purdy Boy's first robbery had netted him nothing but pennies. Everybody also knew that he had graduated to larger accomplishments, serving time for highway robbery in the Missouri State Penitentiary in the 1920s. And everybody knew that he had participated in the Kansas City massacre of several lawmen and a federal agent in 1930. But the humble people of the Cooks and Hills did not fear Purdy Boy, my father said. He was one of their own, and they looked up to him. The stories that spun out into the Oklahoma Nights, into my father's recollections, and eventually into mine, told of people who had met Purdy Boy, who had talked to him, who had received desperately needed cash from his hand. People said that Purdy Boy was finally killed by FBI agents in Ohio while trying to return to his kinfolk in Oklahoma. When he was buried at Salisaw, thousands viewed his body or attended his funeral. Still other stories dwelt on neighbors who were less notorious, but no less interesting. In this vein, my father would speak of a man his mother had known and could produce a photo of if pressed. The man's given name was Stooks, and his surname located him among the most prominent of historic Cherokee families. It was said that as a young man, Stooks was riding his horse the remote area when he was overtaken by darkness and the gathering clouds that signaled the approach of a crashing thunderstorm, the kind that is common in Oklahoma. Not daring to continue on, Stooks sought refuge in a rundown building. He pushed the door open and entered, hoping to stay the night. In order to keep his horse from wandering off, he tied the reins to the door latch. However, once fully inside with the door closed, Stooks found that there was another occupant in the building, a crazy woman with a butcher knife. Crazy women with butcher knives seem to be a surprisingly common theme in a lot of the more rousing stories, my father admitted, so there was some possibility that this tale was invented. In any event, the story went that this particular crazy woman was bent on filleting poor Stooks. <laughs> Stooks was not happy with this turn of events, my father would say, and desired mightily to vacate the premises. The unfortunate traveler let out a howl and thundered toward the door. Unfortunately, the uproar, uproar frightened the horse so much that it reared back, holding the door so tightly closed that it could not be pulled open. After hauling at the exit portal to no avail, Stooks concluded that his horse was stronger than he was and that hiding was the next best thing to running. He crouched in the moonless dark, hoping his would-be assailant couldn't hear him breathing. Just when he almost began to relax, the storm broke right overhead and a blaze of lightning gashed open the sky. It lit up the dusty room like a slice of glory. Stooks could see the woman hunkered in the corner, knife glittering. He slid a few feet to the right, but she'd seen him too in the flash and made a lunge, just missing him. Stooks scooted in another direction. But the next luminous streak revealed him again, and the next. The deathly dance went on and on, both parties desperately maneuvering in the livid bursts, their cries muffled by the booming thunder. 
Much to our disappointment, my father couldn't remember how Stooks finally escaped. <laughs> but he figured the fellow must have finally gotten away with his life. At least he looked lively enough in Grandma's photo. If the accuracy of some of those stories related around those smoky, sparking Oklahoma fires could be questioned, others were real history. They reflected, moreover, a kind of history not often taught in schools. These were stories about the Cherokee people who had come before, our own relatives, and others who had traveled the Trail of Tears from the southeastern United States to Indian Territory at the behest of President Andrew Jackson. Those stories told how in 1838 and 1839, Thousands of Cherokees complied with the order for their removal from their ancestral homelands and how thousands died in the attempt. Dad remembered one elder's story about a young Cherokee mother's journey west. The woman had carried her infant with her, but the baby died, perhaps from exposure, perhaps from starvation or illness he didn't know. The baby had slipped away but the leaders would not allow the ragged party of Cherokees to stop and bury the dead. There was no time, the mother was told. With winter coming on, grief and compassion were luxuries they did not have. The mother, unwilling to abandon her little one without ceremony, pressed the tiny corpse to her body and carried it. The people kept walking all that day and all the following night, still she carried the infant. She wouldn't put her tiny bundle down. Finally, the emigrants arrived at a river. They could go no further. They were forced to stop and make camp. Here, the mother was allowed to lay her little one to rest. I listened to that story and I knew my father carried it as a terrible thing, but also as a precious thing. Now I carried it, and I promised myself that I wouldn't put it down either. The horrors of the Trail of Tears and the turbulent events that followed, the resettlement in a new country, the hell of a civil war that left the Cherokee Nation a smoldering wasteland, the vicious politics of land allotment, left Cherokee communities with deep and transformative scars. Those scars meant that the Oklahoma that I learned about in my father's stories could not be romanticized. The Cooks and Hills could be a dangerous place, sometimes violent, a place where outsiders seldom ventured. Dad remembered visiting a friend in the Indian hospital, a boy whose throat had been slashed by a straight razor in an altercation. He lived. Another friend had his ear bitten off in a fight. He had to manage without it. Dad told of watching, frozen, as his father ran to overpower a neighbor boy who was threatening to kill his own mother with a broken coal oil lamp. The worst of Dad's memories preserved the story of an Indian woman for whom no one intervened. She had gone out one day to look for a lost cow. Wandering over the hills, she'd surprised a group of men whiling away the time in gambling and drinking. People found her body some time later, hacked apart and stuffed into an abandoned well. The case was sufficiently dramatic to stimulate public attention. The murderers were brought to trial, and at least some of them were convicted. <coughs> One could not say the same for many other instances of violence in the Cooks and Hills, however, and my father was rather surprised that there had been an official investigation in this case, let alone court proceedings. It was not natural cynicism that led him to this opinion, but experience. He recalled quite clearly the day that he learned the rules of the larger world as they applied to Indian people. The lesson had come when he overheard a conversation between two adults, white men from a somewhat more prosperous nearby settlement. 
one of these respected church-going men was reporting that a local Cherokee family was starving to death. Debilitated by illness, they were subsisting on little more than the terrapins they could find, and even then there wasn't enough to feed the kids. The other man studied the situation and contemplatively expectorated. It don't matter, he finally decided. They ain't nothing but some damn Indians anyway. The thrifty measure by which the larger society weighed the value of Indian lives probably helped explain why there was not only violence in the Cooks and Hills, but also frequent illness and death. Dad remembered Cherokee families decimated by tuberculosis and watched his own aunt slowly waste away from the disease at the same time as her daughter suffered the crippling stages of polio. Neither one had much in the way of medical attention. The lack of formal health care wasn't unusual. My father couldn't remember ever seeing a doctor when he was growing up. In the ordinary course of events, a blend of patent nostrums, home remedies, and Cherokee medicine got them through. Sassafras tea, brewed from the roots of the tree each spring, would thin the blood and get one ready for hot weather. Stump water removed warts. A good fresh chaw of tobacco cured all kinds of things, including spider bites. A persimmon stick, if heated, would yield sap that could be dripped into an achy ear to treat infection. A few drops of coal oil or turpentine mixed with sugar fixed what ailed you, or at least made you stop complaining. <laughs> Senna tea, they called it Sini, was good for the peaked, as was Bethune's Indian Remedy and Black Draught, a powerful laxative. On the other hand, any one of them would also lay you out howling with cramps. All things considered, it was usually better not to admit to feeling poorly dead conceited. Other kinds of complaints responded to a dose of household magic. Like most children, he knew my father wore a lead slug made from a 22 cartridge on a string around his neck to prevent nosebleeds. It must have worked, he told us. I have never had problems with nosebleeds, even though I stopped wearing that slug years ago. Those who were troubled by uncontrolled bleeding could use the services of a Cherokee medicine man who lived nearby and knew special words to stop hemorrhage. My uncle once saddled up and rode for the man's help when my aunt came home from the dentist after having had all her teeth removed. Nothing the family could do had seemed to stanch the blood but the medicine man set to work, and by the time my uncle returned home, the flow had ceased. In Oklahoma, even the weather could present formidable challenges to people who happened to want to stay alive. The most dramatic of these were the tornadoes. They could touch down, my father said, and cut a swath through the woods that looked like a cleared area under a modern power line. They could drive a stem of wheat clean through a stone wall like a needle puncturing a taut strip of linen. Dad and everyone else in the Cooks and Hills knew that a tornado had once entirely carried off the little town of Pegs just to the north of Gideon, the town nearest to where Dad's family lived. Because of the danger from tornadoes, no one in Cherokee County would be without a storm cellar if they had a choice. The storm cellar was a small underground room dug in some distance from the house, lined with stones and roofed with mounded earth, and it was common to be rousted out of bed during the night with the instruction to go to the cellar. When going to the cellar, the one tool absolutely necessary was a good double-bitted axe. It could be used to chop away branches and other debris that might be blown over the entrance. It was also used to make the Cherokee medicine for protection. My father remembered hunkering in the storm cellar with his mother and sisters was it while his father stood outside the door, the wind tearing at his hair and clothes. There my grandfather used the axe to perform the ritual action that would split the storm in half, causing it to pass harmlessly to either side of the shelter. Although they saw many twisters pass by, 
My father's family never had a tornado strike their place. In a part of the world so beset by dramatic meteorological events, it was important to read the signs that the natural world revealed, my father told us. A woolly caterpillar sporting a wide middle stripe predicted a hard winter. <coughs> the pale white structure inside a split persimmon likewise provided a forecast that helped people judge the quantity of firewood they should lay in for the cold months or the amount of shelter they should prepare for their animals. When the persimmon contained a spoon, this hinted at a lot of snow to shovel. A fork-shaped structure suggested successive periods of piercing cold. A person quietly rejoiced to find a knife inside a persimmon because this meant something would cut the cold, making for a mild winter. As winter closed in, one could observe the behavior of the fire in the hearth. It, it would reveal the day that the promised snow would arrive. Sometimes, my father said, the natural world spoke not only through signs, but more directly. The wind could bring messages to people who knew how to listen. Some of these messages were good news, but some were sad. The winds of early winter usually brought less desirable messages. My father learned this for himself when the wind in the chimney corner whispered an important event, the death of his grandfather. The school was an important center of community life in rural Oklahoma, even though it was just a single room. It possessed only a few dog-eared textbooks, never enough to go around. Having read them all in short order, my father resorted to the only other book the school could offer, a ragged dictionary. There was no electricity in the school, so a dim day made scholarship difficult. Still, illumination permitting, my father spent many hours poring over that old dictionary, marveling at all the words he'd never heard anyone speak. Then one day, he told us, something amazing happened. The teacher, Miss Wisecarver, brought a large metal cabinet into the school. Perhaps it had only seemed large at the time because Miss Wisecarver wasn't very big, but that cabinet was filled, absolutely filled, with books. We had never seen books like that, my father said. We had no idea there were so many books. I actually believed those were all the books in the world. The students could borrow any book they wanted, take it home for the night and bring it back the next day. Dad's favorite, the Teeny Weenies. <laughs> it was a book about a race of miniature people who survived, very like the little people who populate Cherokee traditional tales, by the application of wit and wisdom in the world of large, regular people. Perhaps there was something about that little band of ingenious survivors that reminded Dad of his own community. By working together and treating everyone in their small society equally and with respect, they got by very nicely, he said. My brothers and I loved to read, so we appreciated Dad's enthusiasm for the treasure trove that that cabinet of books represented. But I always wanted to weep when he told us about a friend who came to school clutching the first volume he had ever borrowed and sobbing. He couldn't borrow any more books, he told the teacher. If he did, his father had promised to beat him. The family was very poor, and the father feared the little boy might lose a book. If that happened, there was no money to replace it. That little boy, my father reported, never did learn how to read very well. Each year at holiday time, the tiny school building made room for a Christmas tree, the only one my father ever saw in his boyhood. Parents and children from the surrounding communities crowded into the schoolroom and each child received a small toy and a brown bag of hard candy along with an orange and an apple. In a good year, there might be enough candy and fruit to distribute to the adults, too. 
The teachers purchased the items with funds raised at the autumn pie suppers and cakewalks, and they were the only gifts that children in this impoverished part of the country would receive. My father speculated that perhaps the teachers, poorly paid as they were, also contributed their own funds to make sure the children had a special day. One of my father's stories that I often ask to hear occurred in the week following a school Christmas party. The candy and fruit represented a real windfall for children who rarely tasted candy and would not see another orange until the next year's holiday. The treats had to be enjoyed sparingly and made to last as long as possible. Toward that end, my father had found himself a comfortable spot on the back of a hay wagon to lay out his largesse. He had set out each sweet, his apple, and his orange in a long row and was joyously contemplating which delight he would sample first. Foresight is not a quality to which the young can lay much claim. And it had not occurred to this six-year-old that much of northeastern Oklahoma was at that time open range meaning that cattle were not fenced in, but wandered freely. Inevitably, one of the roving bovines hiked up into the yard, spied something of interest in my father's display, and decided to investigate more closely. The cow, in fact, was old Hersey, a particularly tame and seasoned milker who wasn't at all wary of people and even liked to stand with her head inside the cabin's window or doorway just to keep abreast of family doings. Old Hersey's arrival at this moment was not good news. With a crunch and a slurp, the beautiful shiny apple disappeared into her roamy gullet. <laughs> he cried and cried for disappointment, my father told us, and every time I heard the story, I cried too. <laughs> But my tears were really an indulgence because I had heard this story many times before and I knew it came out all right. My grandfather couldn't bear to see his son unhappy, so he ran for the house and presented my father with the apple from his own Christmas sack. <laughs> of all my father's stories, my very favorite one was about the sunglasses. When, when, he was, yeah, when he was about nine years old, Dad's eyes had started to smart and sting, and bright sun brought on intense pain. The problem persisted, and my grandfather decided it required action. No one in those days had ever heard of a specialist in vision care, but someone suggested sunglasses might be the answer. That meant a trip to Tahlequah, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. The distance from the town of Gideon, nine and a half miles, was manageable. The purchase price of 10 cents presented a little more of a problem. Even into the early days of World War II, rural Oklahoma sustained an economy that operated primarily by, by means of barter, at least in that part of the country. People traded eggs and cream at the local grocery for the few things that could not be produced at home. For that reason, cash was scarce, even 10 cents. Somehow, however, my grandfather put together the coins. It was all the money he had. Then he set out walking. Arriving in Tahlequah, my grandfather made his way to the Woolworths store. There, to his dismay, the clerk informed him that the glasses cost 10 cents plus a sales tax of one mill. The mill was a small cardboard disc that came into use in the 1930s, my father would explain. Also known as a tax token, the mill had a value of one-tenth of one cent and had been devised as a means to give change for state sales tax, which often amounted to some fraction of a cent. Undeterred, my grandfather left the store and walked up and down the streets of Tahlequah, up and down, searching the sidewalks and the gutters. 
Finally, his efforts were rewarded with the discovery of a one mil token that someone had dropped. He returned to Woolworths, purchased my father's sunglasses, and walked the nine and a half miles back home. I teased to hear that story over and over. I never tired of it. I thought it was the best because listening to it, I heard more than the words my father spoke. In this family, the story told me in its silent subtext, the grown-ups take care of the kids. In between the sentences my father repeated, he told his children something else. Even if I don't have very much, he was saying, I will give whatever I've got to take care of you. That's how this family does things. My brothers and I squirmed deeper into our nest of blankets and knew ourselves safe. As years passed, my brothers got too old for the storytelling ritual, but Mom and I remained a willing audience. Dad began to su supplement his recollections of Oklahoma with the books he'd first learned to love in that drafty one-room Oklahoma schoolhouse. Having grown big and wiggly, I left the bed to mom and dad and moved over to the nearby writing desk. This vantage point let me draw or color while keeping in sight the parade of literary characters that passed through that little bedroom. Tom Sawyer, Puddinghead Wilson, Gulliver, Penrod, Silas Marner, Robinson Crusoe, Simon Legree and Little Eva, the Admirable Crichton, and others, and others, and others. My teachers at school would probably have said that many of the selections my father chose were too mature in their subject matter. Does an eight or a 10 year old really appreciate the ironies of Swift's A Modest Proposal? Or the moral dilemmas of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables? At least those authors raised issues that were discussed in my family, and even when the subtleties exceeded my youthful comprehension, I could always appreciate a good story and the sound of my father's voice. Many years later, my father delivered me to Princeton University to begin studies toward a doctoral degree. I remember us gazing up at Nassau Hall, the university's most famous building, <coughs> rendered mute by equal parts of apprehension and amazement. The road that had led him to stand with me in this astonishing place had not been direct. Dad had left Oklahoma upon his high school graduation, not staying long enough even to collect his diploma with $50 in his pocket and all his possessions in a metal footlocker, he had stepped on a trailways bus and headed to New York State in search of opportunities that he could scarcely conjure, but that were clearly unavailable to him if he stayed put. There, Dad had met and married my mother Patricia and settled near her family in upstate New York where they lived for more than 30 years. In 1987, as Dad prepared to hand me over to a sort of life that none of us could begin to imagine, I remember him walking with me around the Princeton campus. We admired buildings where, as a perky university guide informed us, Woodrow Wilson had served as university president, where John F. Kennedy had studied, and where Albert Einstein had conducted research that changed the world. We took in the spiraling staircases of old Nassau, stones worn concave by the tread of generations of students who would go on to lead industries and governments. We admired towering statuary and ionic columns, or were they Doric? We peeped into dormitory rooms of 18th century vintage that came complete with fireplaces and an alcove to house the student's manservant. Dad finally spread his hands helplessly. Who would have thought that 
any child of mine would have this, he said. I was as surprised as he was. But one thing was clear to me. The path that had brought me here was paved with stories. The stories my father told me had taught me how to reason, how to analyze, how to write, how to be critical and careful in those tasks. They taught me to ask questions that I had gone on to pursue in my academic studies, questions about why people do what they do, about how societies are put together and how they can change, about poverty, prejudice, oppression, justice. Even more, those stories gave me a history that tied me inextricably to a place and a people, an Oklahoma Cherokee people. I didn't know where the road upon which I now set my foot would lead, but I had a good start. As it happened, I would finish my PhD at Princeton and then make my way back to Oklahoma. After some brief detours that included a fellowship position at the School of American Research in Santa Fe, as well as a little coursework at the nearby Institute of American Indian Arts and at Navajo College in Arizona, in 1992, I would start my first real job at the University of Tulsa, which is located just on the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. There, I would teach in the Department of Sociology and the Native Studies program. As I delightedly wrote lectures, developed courses, or prepared for travel to professional conferences, I often reflected on how grateful I was, not only to my father, but also to my mother, although I have scarcely mentioned her. If you knew the number of term papers my mother has proofread, the books she has carted home from libraries all over the country, the thesis and dissertation material she has typed, the interviews that woman has transcribed, the research data she has cleaned and collated, the fugitive literature references she has run to earth, or the book chapters she has copy edited, it would bring you to your knees. The footnoting alone would have crushed any person of merely ordinary abilities. So looking out of my classroom window in Tulsa, I thought that in a kinder world, either one of my parents could have done what I had done or more, and they would have loved it as much as I did. I also understood that neither one of them had ever had a single opportunity that was worthy of them. They had nevertheless contrived to give a universe of opportunities to me and never let me sacrifice or diminish that part of me that gave me the most joy, my identity as a Cherokee woman. Reclaiming the Oklahoma landscape that I first knew from my father's telling, I also found a place among the people that populated those tales. Of course, I already knew many of Dad's relatives from our visits back to Oklahoma over summers and Christmases. Now, having moved back to Tulsa, I had the chance to become part of the ongoing life of a community, and I wanted to do everything. I advised Indian student organizations and helped administer educational programs for Indian high school students. I served as a deacon in an Indian church, occasionally volunteered at an Indian health clinic, and served as a local commissioner of Indian affairs. Most satisfyingly, around a relative's kitchen table, I taught an informal class of Cherokee elders how to read and write the Cherokee syllabary, an 85-character writing system that differs dramatically from written English in both theory and form. In exchange, the elders cheerfully gave me language lessons that greatly extended my command of spoken Cherokee, and politely pretended not to be laughing at the funniest accent they'd ever heard. Frequently, we took our little crew on the road. We dropped in at the Wild Onion Dinners, Hog Fries, and All Night Singing, sponsored by the Indian churches. We accepted invitations to the ceremonial dances at different Cherokee stomp grounds. We took in the occasional powwow. 
We invested in the speculative financial markets of Creek Nation bingo. And we visited the Cherokee friends and relatives who had remained in those little hamlets tucked away in the Cooks and Hills. I had found my place in the universe. And then I learned something that my father's stories should already have taught me. I learned that there's a difference between the stories that are captured between the hard covers of a book and the stories that live within an oral tradition. Written stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. When you close the book, the story's finished and over. But an oral tradition is never subdued by its vessel. It is fruitful, and it multiplies. It endlessly gives birth to new stories. When I met an extraordinary man named Javier Lopez, I learned that one's life is much better described in an oral tradition than a written one. Although I had not imagined leaving Oklahoma or ever wanting to, I surprised everyone by marrying Javier and relocating with him to the East Coast, where I would take a job in the Department of Sociology at Boston College. It was, at the time, a wrenching decision to leave the place and the people that I first came to know in my father's stories and that I had finally reclaimed. But as my own story continued to unfold, I discovered that it was possible to fulfill one's responsibilities as a tribal citizen, even from the distance of half a continent, because it was important for me to continue to contribute to a Cherokee community even though I was no longer living in one, I sought additional professional training through a postdoctoral program at the University of Colorado Denver's Native Elder Research Center. That training has allowed me to put my skills as a sociologist to work to serve tribal needs as a healthcare researcher. Now I travel between Boston and Oklahoma working on projects that are designed in collaboration with Cherokee Nation Health Services. This work reflects the tribe's commitment to deliver the highest standard of care to all patients served by the tribal <laughs> clinics and its special concern for elders. I hope that one day, in another of those surprising switchbacks that a living oral tradition readily accommodates, I will end up back in Cherokee Nation. I do not know that this will be true, but I know that one way or another, my story will always be joined to the stories of Oklahoma and the Cherokee people. And that is why I will always think of myself as not only a tribal citizen in the legal sense, but how I came to know myself as a Cherokee woman. Thank you.